G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Talkspace a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, trying to balance work, home, relationships, and everything else is challenging for everyone. On top of our everyday obligations, we have to deal with underlying fear and uncertainty from the pandemic, with many of our normal support systems no longer in place. Working with a therapist can give you the support that you're missing right now. Having someone to talk through your worries and help prioritize what's really important can work wonders. Because now more than ever, it's a good idea to seek out a little extra help for our busy, demanding lives. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform that has thousands of licensed therapists trained in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationships, and more. And your therapist can help you set and achieve your goals. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy, you can sign up online and start therapy the same day as you sign up. You can text, video, or even send voice messages to your licensed therapist, so it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your own home. And when I talk to my therapist about my goals in life, along with how to improve my relationships with my family, it felt great airing things out and really helped me with moving forward in a positive mind frame. Talkspace is also a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy, Instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7 and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. Talkspace is also secure and private, using the latest end-to-end -end backgrade encryption technology to store client information and complies with the latest HIPAA regulations. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. So to match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com and make sure to use the code SCARED to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's SCARED and Talkspace.com. This happened back in the summer of 2015 when I was serving in the United States Army Reserves. I was stationed in southern Alabama in a transportation company. Sometimes, my girlfriend would come with me on drill weekends and we would crash at a friend of hers apartment, which is where this incident took place. So, this particular weekend, we were in a large convoy in the middle of nowhere, on some back road out in the sticks well over 100 miles from the city. That was when I got the most just confusing, bizarre and downright creepy phone call of my young life. She was in utter hysterics. She was crying and screaming, wondering why I would frighten her so badly. She was asking me what my problem was and how I even pulled it off. After I was finally able to calm her down, this is the story that she relayed to me. Sometime that afternoon, her friend was at work and she was at the apartment by herself. Suddenly, there was a loud bang at the door, not a knock, several loud, violent bangs, she said looking through the peephole she saw me but there was something off she says that i was wearing my army uniform it looked like me but it had this very angry or aggravated look on my face she opened the door wondered why i was home so early and apparently without saying a word i just angrily blew past her shoulder checking her into the wall and quickly walked down the hall taking a left into the bedroom slamming the door behind me so hard that the whole place shook she was obviously very alarmed and confused about why I was home so early and in such an agitated state. I mean, that was really out of character for me. I am not a violent guy at all, and on top of that, if something did happen to set me off, she would have been the first to hear about it. So she's walking behind me, trying to get some information out of me, and she opens the bedroom door behind me and sees the closet door slam shut. She proceeds to run over to see what I was doing in her friend's closet and claims that when she opened the door, it was completely empty. That was when she had a panic attack and called me. Now, imagine my shock and confusion hearing that story knowing that I was well over a hundred miles away at the time. She finally believed me after I sent her a photo with my current GPS location, which only served to freak her out even more. To be honest though, I thought that there must be some kind of rational explanation for what she saw. 
I will be honest though and say that she did smoke a little weed here and there, but at the time I know that she was sober. She didn't mess around with hard drugs or anything, or, or drink, and she had no mental illness of any kind. And over the years since that happened, I have come to learn about a phenomenon called doppelgangers. I don't know what they mean, or what they represent, or why they come around. All I know is that it's really creepy. And a girl that I dated for several years came face to face with mine, and it put the fear of God into the poor girl. Take from this story what you will, and honestly, I, I don't really care if anyone believes me or not. I just have to get it off my chest because it's bugging me. Thanks for listening, though, even if I'm not a great storyteller. I live in Georgia, in a rural town not so far from a major city. There's a set of woods that's behind our house, and it divides into two neighborhoods, and it's about a mile wide, if that. Strange occurrences have always surrounded these woods. Small things like random trash, tarps, etc. I should mention, too, that it's more swampy marsh than woods, so it makes camping in there pretty much impossible. And one night, I was taking our dog out... He stays in the back half of the house due to him not liking the other dogs. I took him out the side door and walked around the house to the fence. And for some reason, when we left the house, he was absolutely terrified. He didn't want to go out, which was very unusual for a dog who's quick to snatch someone's soul if prompted. Just thinking that he was acting a bit weird, we pushed onward. After he tinkled, we walked back, and this is when I noticed it, or... Perhaps rather heard it, I think. Crunching of leaves. At first, I thought that it was one of our dozen cats on the property until I realized that it was matching my steps. Like, if I walked, you could hear it walking. If I stopped, it stopped too. There's a small clearing between the woods where one of the sheds is too. And that's when we saw it. My dog was the first to see something and then I saw some... I don't really know how to explain it, but creature. It was taller than the shed, so maybe a good eight feet tall, and it darted across the clearing at a crazy fast speed. And my dog, who again isn't scared of anything, bolts so fast that I dropped his leash and he ran to the door whining. I was quickly behind him too, and once we were inside, I quickly bolted the door and ran to tell my girlfriend what happened. She immediately wanted to investigate, saying that it's probably a woodland creature. Armed with two flashlights, we went out the front door, and as we walked towards the wood line, we could hear something moving around. It sounded maybe 200 yards away if I had to guess. But as we scanned with our flashlights, we saw nothing, but kept hearing it. Then we heard it get closer and closer, until it was maybe 20 feet away, I would guess. Still nothing though, no eyes, not even an animal call, just rustling. My girlfriend, now scared, heads for the house and I decided to check with the neighbours to see if maybe one of their many dogs got out. When I arrived at his house, my neighbour, who his name is Dave, explained that all his dogs were accounted for. You're curious though, he came to investigate with me. And this is when I noticed that Whatever this thing was, followed me along the wood line to Dave's house and was now behind Dave's house. Gun in hand now, we went into his backyard scanning for, well, anything really. We could hear it rustling or maybe running, but we still couldn't see anything. About a hundred yards away now in thick, swampy woods. Way too thick for a person to walk in, let alone run in. But then, all of a sudden, it just stopped. It was dead silent now, and scanning on the edge of where we were, we see nothing. And then, all of a sudden, it was five feet in front of us, sprinting at me. It slammed the fence so hard that it rocked it back and forth. Dave, now terrified, shot randomly at, well, nothing. Because, truthfully, we never saw it. Again, as I mentioned, the woods are thick. Too thick to run in, so... What the heck teleported silently in front of us and slammed the gate like that? Spooked now, we were about to run, but 
Then we heard it again. And this time, it sounded like it was talking, maybe. It was sort of human in nature, but not English. It sounded... I don't know. I don't want to sound crazy, but alien-like? Not a language that I recognize, that's for sure, but then again, I don't know many languages. And Dave, he heard it too. He's a hunter for like the last 40 years, and still to this day, he can't explain what that was. Anyway, after we heard that, that was enough, and we bolted it. He covered me, and I ran to my house. Not 10 minutes later, we both heard a loud explosion coming from the woods. It shook our houses and flickered our power, in fact, and I ran outside to see what it was, and of course there was nothing again. But when Dave came out and confirmed that he felt the same thing, we were both once again terrified because it meant that we weren't imagining this. Moments later, a few strangers from the neighborhood came driving down to our cul-de-sac, and they all agreed the blast sound that they heard came from behind our house. 911 was called and the two police officers interviewed us separately. Our stories matched and the responding officers refused to go anywhere near those woods. Probably because they're marshland, like I said. But they took the report though and they left and to this day we're still not sure what the encounter was. Also these days, Dave just doesn't go outside at night anymore because it spooked him that bad. I'm sorry if this is a poorly told story, I'm not the best of it, but I can assure you that everything that I've just told you is true. So I was hiking the CDT in Colorado about uh, maybe a day north of Dillon, Silverthorne, and was crossing a deep little creek that was giving me trouble. Another guy caught up to me and found a better crossing a little off the trail, so I used it, talked to the guy for a bit, and walked another mile or so and set up my camp. The other guy did too, though. In the morning, I left early and hiked up a steep slope and along a ridge where the other guy caught up to me and stuck with me like glue. He started talking about hiking the rest of the trail together, but I didn't want to, and I said that I had stuff to do off the trail at various places further along. But this guy, he just didn't get it, and started saying that we could save money buying food together and planning meals and stuff. I said that I was fine how I was and was a picky eater anyway. I started changing my pace, going faster and slower, but whatever I did, I just couldn't get rid of this guy. Now, there's a brutal road walk past Pettingill Peak that climbs up a pass toward a mountain, and I bolted up there, but... The guy was killing himself trying to keep up and started telling me that I was being mean and should wait for him so we could hike together. I wanted nothing to do with this guy though and I just kept going. But as I was hiking around the peak, I stopped for a few seconds to grab some food and yep, he caught up again. He started saying that I was lucky that he caught up in time for us to set up camp together and started saying that it would make more sense if we just set up one tent and shared it so there's less work and it would be warmer. I have a one person lightweight tiny tent mind you. So I just grabbed my pack and I left, went back around and straight down the mountainside to a forestry road with this guy following me again. It got dark and hard to see but I was on the forestry road by then and heading into Winter Park. A few miles before town there was a forest fire and some forestry crews working on it. They were all back at their camp just off the road, so I went to them and asked if I could put up my tent just behind them in a clearing. A few minutes later, I saw the other guy go past. I was jumpy and a little bit scared after that and got off the trail in Grand Lake for a few days, went to Denver and bummed around, got back on the trail and was a little bit paranoid at first but didn't see the guy again and when I asked other hikers if they'd seen him, nobody recognize the description. I'm 6'2 and 200 pounds, but man, I'll take wild animals over that guy any day. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Native a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. 
So self-care is a two-way street. There's you and there's the products you use. And that's why you deserve a brand that puts the same care into their products that you put into yourself, like Native. Native cares about what you put on your armpits. That's why their deodorants ingredients list includes things that you've actually heard of, like coconut oil and shea butter. Another plus, none of their products are tested on animals and almost everything is vegan. Native is risk-free to try. Every product comes with free shipping within the US, plus free 30-day returns and exchanges. Plus, they have options too. Native has a line of sensitive deodorants for people with baking soda sensitivities, plastic-free deodorants if you're trying to cut down on your plastic consumption, and even an unscented option if you're all about your natural scent. And if you want to try something a little different, check out their rotating seasonal scents. You can even subscribe to Native, so you'll never have to sweat about running out of deodorant ever again. So, make the switch to Native today by going to nativedeo.com slash scared, or use promo code scared at the checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's nativedeo.com slash scared, or use promo code scared at the checkout for 20% off your first order. So... I was out doing some late night fishing in a small but deep hole on the side of the state road near my house. Every time that I fish there at night by myself, I worry about what would happen or what I would do if someone were to pull over next to me, but it's never really happened. Until now that is. So quick detour for the second story. I wasn't always like this. I used to fish by myself in the middle of the night all the time and without a care in the world. But there was one night about maybe 10 years ago now, which perhaps merits its own post, but I'll slide it in here and include it in this story anyways, where I was fishing off a seawall next to a bridge and a car pulls over next to me. Two young men, but older than I was at the time, got out. They walked up to me casually and asked me if I was catching anything. I told them no, not really. I wasn't really suspicious of them or anything. I thought that they were going fishing and just thought that they would ask if I was having any luck or not before pulling their gear out. Now, the bridge was a, a popular fishing spot. I was sitting on the cement seawall with my feet dangling over the edge. One of the men, though, suddenly shoves me off the seawall into the water. They both grab my fishing gear and take off in their car. The fall was only about seven feet or so, a complete guess, but it was enough that I couldn't lift myself out of the water and up the cement wall. I had to swim around to where the water was more shallow so that I could climb up the wall. My mum had dropped me off that night and I was supposed to call her to pick me up later in the night, but my cell phone had gotten wet and would no longer work. To make matters worse, I was a smoker at the time going on two years without smoking or any other form of nicotine, which is good, I suppose. But my cigarettes had also gotten wet, and as you can imagine, I really needed a cigarette. I didn't know what to do except to just, well, sit there until eventually my mum drove up randomly. She was furious too, until I explained what happened but I shudder when I think about how I, or anybody else that they did this to, could have actually died. These people had no idea whether or not I knew how to swim. I was, or am, a very strong swimmer, thankfully, but apparently they just didn't care. If they had seen on the news the next day that I had drowned under the bridge, would they put two and two together? Would they even care? Even if you assume everybody is a strong swimmer, the person could hit their head. There were a lot of rocks under the sea wall, and be unconscious pretty quickly. And for what? $50 of cheap fishing gear? Anyways, clearly, ever since this night, 10-ish years ago, I've been much more cautious when I'm alone at night, but especially when I'm fishing alone at night. So... Back to what actually happened tonight, which triggered me to write this post. So I had, luckily, just finished up and loaded my car back up with all my gear. I was actually sitting in my car and making an Instagram post showing the fish that I caught. A couple of yellow bullhead catfish and some bluegill. I was trying to quickly write the post and then head home, so I was deep into the world of my phone, not really paying attention to anything else. 
Something causes me to look up, though, and out of my driver's side window, there's this pickup truck sitting there that I did not ever see pull up. It has one of those big steel frame structures around the bed of the truck. I don't know what they're called, but I associate them with hunters or trappers. Mind you, I have no idea whatsoever if that's an accurate association or not. I do feel like I have seen them, though, or... Something similar, holding kennels with hunting dogs, so maybe that's where I got the idea from. In any case, there is this very stereotypical chubby redneck mullet type guy looking into my window at me, smiling, a creepy smile. He was the passenger. I didn't or couldn't really look past him to the driver. I have no idea how long they were sitting there, but I very quickly debate winding down my window and asking what they wanted, but... Settled on putting my car into drive, driving around their truck and down the street. I was so freaked out that I didn't immediately go home in fact. I went somewhere else and pulled over, looked around to see if they were anywhere to be seen and then I actually went back to the fishing spot to see if they were still sitting there or not. I didn't pull over mind you, I just drove by but they were not there. It will drive me crazy wondering why they pulled over. Did they have something bad planned? Were they just curious? Wanted to help? Will I have to worry about seeing them around town after driving off on them like that? I realized that my reaction was not completely fair. They could have been just pulling over to fish. Although, you've got to realize how small this fishing hole is. It's a literal fishing hole on the side of the road. It's probably about the size of a, a dining room or something. They could have been pulling over to see if I needed help or something. Who knows? But all I know is that I was thinking that if I wind down the window to find out what they want, I could end up with a gun in my face for all I know. And then I would not get a chance to just drive off. So I drove off without acknowledging them in any way so that I didn't miss my chance. Even now I worry about the fact that my car has some slightly identifying marks. Nothing crazy noticeable, but just small stickers in the window. And that's, I tick them off by driving off like that or something, and they live around here. What if my wife meets up with them at some point? What if she has my daughter with her? Am I just being paranoid? I don't know. I'm still a little freaked out by the whole experience, because it was weird, to say the least. My boyfriend and I were backpacking in Yosemite last week. We were trying to make it to Little Yosemite Valley after having to turn back on our original trial due to ice. We didn't get to Little Yosemite due to our late start and had to illegally camp above Vernal Falls. But here's where it gets weird. Full disclosure too, I had taken an edible weed gummy before bed. I usually take one and a half but only took one and don't really think this is the reason for what happened but who knows, maybe. Anyway, shortly after falling asleep, I felt this weird sensation like an electric zap on one temple. I felt it move through my brain and out the other temple and it jolted me awake so suddenly and harshly that I was sort of taken aback. I know it sounds crazy, but I was freaked, wrote it off as a really strange dream, I think, and just started to fall back to sleep. As I laid down, I noticed I had a slight feeling of pressure in the back of my eyes. Shortly after I fell back asleep, I was once again abruptly awoken by an electric zap type feeling, this time on the back of my thighs. As I was waking, my legs twitched like you would imagine with some sort of an electric surge and I had a tingling feeling in my thighs. At this point, I was really weirded out and stayed awake staring at the ceiling of the tent, trying so hard to make sense of it. As I laid there, my body was slightly twitching, starting at my ankle, then my leg, then my shoulder, all on the right side. I remember having the thought that it feels like I'm a robot that's being worked on and my mind wandered to the idea of what if I'm actually in a pod or a lab somewhere and the world is all a simulation. That thought may have been the gummy for sure. But I thought about waking my boyfriend, but worried that I would sound crazy so... I hesitantly let myself just fall back asleep, hoping that it wouldn't happen again. 
but I was shortly awoken by another zap in my lower abdomen that felt like it caused a sort of contraction. At this point, I was so scared and certain that I wasn't dreaming or imagining it, and immediately woke up my boyfriend, terrified, saying that I keep feeling like I'm being electrocuted. I told him everything, and he pet my head, told me that it was okay, and as he later told me, spent some time praying. Neither of us are religious or anything, so it was a bit weird, but he's a lot more spiritual than I am, I think. At this time, I also noticed a weird feeling in my abdomen that hadn't been there before this last shock. I eventually had to pee but was too scared to leave the tent alone so I asked him to walk out with me. And when I got out there you guys, I could honestly barely walk. I was stumbling around and falling over as if I was just off my face but we hadn't even had a sip of alcohol that day or night or anything. I'm also an experienced backpacker so I don't think it would have been overworked muscles or anything and a gummy has never had any impact on my ability to walk like that. In any case I stumbled my way to a rock to lean on and fell once or twice before managing to prop myself up to pee then got back in the tent without much issue. Thankfully nothing really weird happened after that but the difficulty walking really made me feel like something strange had happened that night. Funnily enough too I felt completely normal and fine the next day, apart from being thoroughly weirded out of course. Let me start by saying that I'm a 14 year old male student from England. This happened to me back in September of 2020. Now I had been decently acquainted with a girl called Olivia since the end of primary school. She was not a good looking girl by any means. At the time that this happened she was actually pretty well, overweight. Now, this will come into play later too. Around 5'5 five five, and she had a really horrible sense of humor as well. But basically she was the complete opposite of me. One day though on the first week back after the UK's first lockdown she started following me on Instagram. Of course I didn't find it any more than normal at the time but that was the start of a uh, really strange creepy ordeal. She would send me DMs most days asking how I was, what I was doing, that sort of thing. It went on like this for around 10 days and while I didn't find this too creepy at the time, I had no idea how much worse it would get. After a while she would constantly DM me at least 10 times every few hours, each one stranger than the next as well. She would start by saying how cool I was which struck me as weird as I was pretty much the definition of a nerd and still am today, and how I was perfect. She would constantly remind me that she dreams about me every night, and she wants to run away with me. That was when something finally clicked in my brain, and I realized just how strange this was getting, and I blocked her. And for a few days, that actually worked. Before, she made a new account. At first it was the same as last time, just the same odd messages about her loving me, but then it changed. It changed to her going on rants about how nobody liked her, gee I wonder why as well, and how she was going crazy without me. The weirdest one though was when she messaged me talking about how she was stress eating everything that she could find because she was going crazy over love. This was getting too much now and I told my parents who told me to put my Instagram account on private and tell them if anything else happened. Strangely enough, it worked. She had completely stopped everything. Creepy DMs, the new accounts, everything. So fast forward a month or so to the middle of the night. I was going up the hill that I live on to the supermarket to get some things for Halloween and stuff when I saw a girl around my age crossing the street towards me. I looked at her for one second before realizing that through the hood over her head, it was Olivia. You see, I had been homeschooled by a private tutor for the last month to avoid her, so I was surprised that I saw her, but I did. Instincts kicked in immediately and I'm running up the hill. I heard Olivia mumble something under her breath before attempting to run after me. I might have been a nerd, but I was kind of in good shape at the time, so... I was able to get to the supermarket at least 30 seconds before her. 
I immediately went to an employee who thankfully stepped in before she got there. She was extremely out of breath from running up the hill maybe 50 meters. The employee grabbed her and went to a phone. He called the police and told them my story, also mentioning a knife in her pocket, which I didn't see at the time. During this time, she was just staring straight at me too. I could clearly see now that there was something wrong with her. She had clearly stuck to her word of eating everything that she could find as I could see that she had gained at least another well, 20 kilos, I think. Her hair was longer and messier. Her clothes were just so tiny that you could see the bottom of her belly sticking out of the bottom of her hoodie and she had a really sort of crazed, deranged look about her. When the police came to take her away, she stared me straight in the face and said one of the most haunting things of my life. She said, just so you know, I never loved you. You're lucky I'm so overweight because if I wasn't, I would have caught you and slit your throat. Thank God that that was the last time that I ever saw her. I started going back to school and my life slowly went back to normal. But obviously, that's not something that you forget easily. I guess if there's anything to learn from this story, then it's to never judge a book by their cover because you never know if they're just a crazy psycho like that girl. This happened after I went to university, so I was 18. I made an effort to make friends after I moved onto campus and ended up with a few groups to hang out with, including a new girlfriend and plenty of people from my classes that I liked well enough. But there was one class before lunch where it was traditional for people to go to the cafeteria afterwards to eat in pairs or threes. I wasn't very discerning about who I'd have lunch with because fine with most people from the class and we were all trying to make an effort to be social. So when one girl, Lily, asked if I wanted to eat lunch together after that class, I didn't have any reason not to go. We talked about school and that kind of thing. Nothing noteworthy, but she did ask me to get lunch with her again the next week. It became a pattern and there wasn't exactly a way to start saying no suddenly. It was fine though, but it did mean that I lost the chance to eat lunch with anyone else on those days. In hindsight, I suppose that that was probably the point. Now, One day in class, I asked someone if I could add them on social media. But this happened in front of Lily, and I saw her face jerk towards me from a couple of seats over. It was a sharp reaction that it was hard to ignore, and I still remember it. By the time that I got home later that day... Lily had sent me a friend request. No friends in common. I don't know how she even knew my last name. I was a bit surprised to be honest, but I guess that she just dug through the university social media pages and found me through there or something. It definitely gave me a bad feeling, but surely it was fine, right? She ended up messaging me a lot and commenting on anything that I posted, in fact. I told myself that she was just awkward and we became friends, if not close. I mean, I'd known worse people for sure. She still always got me to go and eat lunch with her after our one shared class. Other than that though, we rarely spent time together in person. Sure, I saw her around sometimes, but I never went out of my way to hang out with her or anything. So it was mostly online messaging and seeing each other in group settings. Coincidentally, my girlfriend was also called Lily. This was something that clearly bothered Lily as well. And not my girlfriend, who couldn't have found it less interesting. It was just a common name at the time. She occasionally hinted that she wanted my girlfriend to pick a different name or joked about her not suiting it. She clearly didn't like my girlfriend at all and I had no idea why. It was getting hard to ignore by this point too, but... Lily was starting to unsubtly hint that she had a crush on me. I tried not to address it because, I mean, what was I going to say? I mean, I've never really known what to do when a friend makes a pass at me, to be honest. I was also not interested in the least, and even ignoring the weird stuff that she pulled, Lily was just not my type at all. She tended to dress and act in a way somewhere between like a 50s housewife and one of those adults who's still obsessed with Disney princesses, if you can picture that. 
but things took uh, an uncomfortable turn on the day of our last shared class of that year. Instead of asking me to lunch like she always did, Lily asked if I'd go for a walk with her. Again, I didn't exactly know how to refuse, so I said all right. Our campus was bordered by a large part of woodland, and Lily led me into the woods, and the sounds of our fellow students slowly faded away. She sat down on a log, and I joined her. She started talking about how she was going to miss me over the summer. I tried placating her, but I didn't want to be there, especially because she seemed almost on the verge of tears. I think I tried to make an excuse about having plans with my girlfriend, but before I could leave, Lily chose to kiss me without warning. It was uncomfortable too, to say the least. I got out of there and was happy to think that I wouldn't see her for a while. I came back to university after the summer, moving into a house with my friends. But without going off topic too, there were some serious issues in my friend group. A lot of petty arguing and worse, and I broke up with my girlfriend around the start of that school year as well. And basically the whole mess made me recontextualize things with Lily because it just suddenly didn't seem as bad. But that said, I didn't want to be alone with her, that's for sure. But we mostly just talked online. I mean, she was still constantly messaging me after all. One upside of everything though is that I started dating a boy. But Lily was not pleased to hear that. I think she hoped to sneak in after I broke up with my girlfriend, but as I said before, that was never going to happen. There wasn't a big gap between my breakup and this new relationship too, so she must have thought that she missed her chance to be with me. But this is where the story gets weird. So at this time, I was fairly active on Tumblr. I occasionally talked about my life and mostly reblogged photos and stuff. I was on there one day too when something odd happened. One of the blogs that I followed had received an ask with some phrases that I recognized. It took me a second to register too that it was taken from my about page. And that made me freeze. I read the message properly that someone was asking this completely random person to analyze a section of text from my page, asking for their opinion on the type of person who would write it. I cannot stress how messed up it was to see people talking about me like I was a character in a book that they were trying to study. The reply was basically, I don't know, sorry, but the important thing was that the question hadn't been anonymous. It linked to someone's blog. Obviously, I wanted to know who had taken such a bizarre interest in me. As far as I knew, no one in real life other than my boyfriend knew about my page. Well... No prizes for guessing who was behind it. But what I found was creepy. It was like a shrine. She was using a fake name, but I recognized Lily all over that thing. It was this cutesy pink and red page. There were a few posts about her interests, but most of the content was focused on her primary interest, me. Most of the posts were about me. There were accounts of things that I'd done recently. Like, he told me about such and such, and he went to a nightclub recently, etc. As well as references to things from as far back as I'd known her, really. It was clear that she had been keeping tabs on me, both online and offline. Gathering up every scrap of information that she could about my life and hoarding it here in her creepy collection. She talked about us eating lunch together and how special our dates had been to her, as if it was anything more than acquaintance getting food after class. She talked about the time that she had forcibly kissed me in the woods, but wrote it off as if it had been mutual. She quoted lyrics from my favorite song and talked about how she'd always be there for me, no matter who else came into my life. There were lots of references to loving me just the way that he is, which answered another mystery about an anonymous love letter that I'd received earlier that year with the same wording. But it got worse. You see, there were a lot of posts about my boyfriend as well. But these weren't so nice. In fact, they got vicious, talking about how he didn't deserve me. He didn't know what he had. If she was with me, she'd be jealous of anyone else who came near me. So my boyfriend not being a jealous person meant that he didn't love me. It was angry and hateful, and I didn't like to think about the sort of person who could write so obsessively being fixated on me. 
One thing that didn't make any sense at first was that the blog also made plenty of references to Lily's best friend, Stephen. She had never mentioned this person to me. Her post talked a lot about Stephen and how great a friend he was, and how much fun they had together, how he looked out for her, etc. I was trying to work out whether this was an online friend when one specific post made it all click. You see, she had posted a photo and captioned it with Stephen sent this to me, he knew that I would like it and I love it, or something like that. The problem was that the photo, it was taken from my own page. I hadn't sent it to her. She took it from my page and then claimed that this fictional best friend of hers shared it with her because in her head, she'd split me into two people or something. In her messed up fantasy life, I was both the perfect best friend who was always looking out for her and her soulmate who was bound to end up with her when I finally got over my sweet kind boyfriend and all the other easy girls I hung out with that she made dozens of posts complaining about. And who was she complaining to? Well, Lily, she had an audience. She asked open questions about me and her relationship with me and got messages back from her followers, people who took what she said at face value. I saw a bunch of random people agreeing with this stalker that my boyfriend didn't deserve me and that we were bound to break up soon so that I could be with Lily, the person that I was allegedly clearly supposed to be with. She had this fake fanfiction version of my life up for anyone to share their opinion on and she'd made herself out to be the hero of it all. I went maybe a month back into this page's history. I didn't look at everything that was there. It was too much, so I'm not sure how long this had actually been going on for. Needless to say, though, I sent Lily a message confronting her about the blog. She said nothing, and I cannot stress how weird it was to have found pages and pages dedicated to me, with her talking about how she was in love with me and would make sure that we ended up together, slamming my boyfriend and building a fantasy life with two different versions of me in it that she clearly believed to be real. Then, acting like it hadn't happened. She said nothing. She didn't address it. She just changed the subject, even after I pushed. And it was like she hadn't even registered what I'd said. I've never seen anything else like it. It was weird. She deleted the page, of course, or at least changed the name and hid it, so I never found it again. But it wasn't the end, though. I wasn't going to hang out with her anymore, but we were still shoved together in classes and she had started actually to scare me with what she might do next. I'm kind of a paranoid person to be honest, and knowing that someone was obsessively keeping track of me for who knows how long really freaked me out. The next thing she tried to pull though was trying to seduce my boyfriend. It was an absolutely useless attempt that only made him uncomfortable. He told me about it right away, but what was her plan there? Did she hope to tell me that he cheated and waited for me to break up with him? Why would I want her after that? But when that didn't work out for her, she tried hitting on three of my other friends. But none of them took the bait, mind you, but she ended up dating one of my former housemates for a while, but she made sure to send me messages while they were together letting me know that she'd rather be with me. No thanks. Lily made sure to stay in my life the whole time that I was at university. There was a time when I tried to pull away from her and she ended up starting rumors about me and damaging a career opportunity that I put a lot of work into. I don't know what else she did behind my back but it made me realize that it was safer to let her think that she was part of my life while just ignoring her rather than doing something that would cause her to get angry. After I graduated, Lily still wanted to spend time together, but I knew that I didn't have to. I made excuses about work and barely talked to her after that point. I almost entirely stopped posting on social media that I knew she knew about. Of course, she didn't give up that easily. She tried to start conversations, asked me to meet up with her, attempts that I usually ignored. I didn't like to think that she was still tracking me online, but she probably was. I don't know how to, but she'd occasionally reference things that I mentioned online somewhere, somewhere she shouldn't have known about really. The last time that we had a real conversation though, she sent me a message out of nowhere. We hadn't spoken at all in months and 
We hadn't talked about anything serious in a much longer time than that. But thinking about that conversation, though, it still makes my skin crawl. But I'll try and summarize what happened. So at first she asked me some questions about how long had I known that I was queer. I told her some basic stuff, the kind of thing like I'd tell anyone who asked. Then she changed the subject. She started talking about how I would feel about her if she was a boy, about wanting to be a boy for me. The messages quickly became fetishistic. She went into plenty of detail about the fantasies that she had of the two of us. Again, we were not friends at this point. We'd never been especially close, at least not from my perspective, and we'd barely spoken for years. But at this point, it was clear that we were not friends. I can't imagine sending messages like that to even a close friend, mind you, let alone someone who barely knows you. I tried telling her not to pull this on me, but she decided to change tactics. She sent photos of herself, followed by a bunch of messages, maybe four or five a minute, way too fast for me to reply before the next one arrived, basically quoting back what I told her about myself and my past earlier. She was telling me these things as if they had happened to her, she was role-playing as me. And the worst part was that she seemed to believe that it was real. That those things actually had happened to her, even when she was quoting me word for word. Things that I'd told her only hours before were now her life. It was like she was trying to absorb my history or something. To take it over. To make my life part of her. Yeah... I didn't talk to her again after that. I ignored future attempts that she made to talk to me and I eventually silently deleted her from the inactive social media which was her only way of really contacting me. I really thought that she might finally move on to be honest as well. But a few days ago she sent me a new friend request. It's sitting there unanswered because I know if I delete it she'll only send another one. Lily and I, we met nearly 12 years ago now. This story is just the highlights. Even then, and even then, it's only the stuff that I know about for sure. A lot more happened behind my back. I know it did. Anyway, this is my life, and it's not what I wanted or asked for, but it's something that I just have to live with now. G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here. And I would like to give Talkspace a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. So, trying to balance work, home, relationships and everything else is challenging for everyone. On top of our everyday obligations, we have to deal with underlying fear and uncertainty from the pandemic, with many of our normal support systems no longer in place. Working with a therapist can give you the support that you're missing right now. Having someone to talk through your worries and help prioritize what's really important can work wonders. Because now more than ever, it's a good idea to seek out a little extra help for our busy, demanding lives. Talkspace is the number one online therapy platform that has thousands of licensed therapists trained in over 40 specialties, including anxiety, depression, relationships, and more. And your therapist can help you set and achieve your goals. I wholeheartedly recommend Talkspace for therapy. You can sign up online and start therapy the same day as you sign up. You can text, video, or even send voice messages to your licensed therapist, so it's incredibly convenient to have virtual sessions from the comfort of your own home. And when I talk to my therapist about my goals in life, along with how to improve my relationships with my family, it felt great airing things out and really helped me with moving forward in a positive mind frame. Talkspace is also a fraction of the cost of in-person therapy, Instead of waiting for an appointment, you can send unlimited messages to your therapist 24-7 and they'll engage with you daily, five days a week. Talkspace is also secure and private, using the latest end-to-end -end backgrade encryption technology to store client information and complies with the latest HIPAA regulations. As a listener of this podcast, you'll get $100 off your first month with Talkspace. So to match with a licensed therapist today, go to Talkspace.com and make sure to use the code SCARED to get $100 off your first month and show your support for the show. That's SCARED and Talkspace.com. 
In 2008, I was driving from New Orleans, LA, to Eugene, OR. It was just me, 22-year-old female, and my year-old pit bull in a 14-foot U-Haul truck with everything that I owned crammed into the back, a fancy flip phone, and my printout MapQuest directions. I think the first smartphones actually came out around that time, but I didn't have one. Cell phone service was also much spottier, and there were long stretches through the desert where I had zero service for hundreds of miles. So, I was driving a lonely stretch of highway through central Texas when I realized I hadn't seen a town or an exit for a very long time, and my giant U-Haul was really low on gas now. Just when I'm starting to freak out and seriously run out of gas, I see a small town coming up. I pull into this town and it is tiny. I was so worried about other things that I never did pay attention to the name of the town, but there were only like six streets in the whole place. In any case, I go and gas up and am ready to get back on the road. Except, I cannot for the life of me find my way back to the highway. I circle the town about four times I would guess and start getting so frustrated because this is such a tiny town so how the heck can I not find my way out? I can literally see the highway but for some reason I just can't get onto it. I return to the gas station to ask for directions. When I got gas I paid at the pump and never actually went in but when I enter for the directions, there's a skinny, sort of nondescript guy who has black hair hanging down in the front of his eyes that looks like it could use a good wash. He's not particularly creepy or anything, but a little rude. He never really met my eyes. He was looking down at a magazine. He gives me directions that don't sound right at all. He's telling me to take a road that will get me to the highway in about 17 miles. For a moment, though, I am just dumbfounded. Then I point out that I didn't drive that far to get from the highway into the town, so why so far to get back to the highway? I mean, I can literally see it from the town. He is really casual, almost like I'm just an annoyance and can follow his directions or not. Why should he care? He gives me some explanation about the road curving around that doesn't really make sense. He still doesn't look at me, mind you. He still doesn't look at me too. Just whatever, I gave you the directions and waved his hand in the direction of the door. When I got into the parking lot, my whole body started trembling violently and my heart started racing, seemingly for no reason. I get into the truck and as soon as I put my key into the ignition, I just burst into tears. I had the most terrible feeling that no matter how nonchalant he acted, this man had bad intentions. I didn't know what, but... I knew right then and there that there was no way that I was going to follow his directions. Yet, this was the only store in this little town, and short of knocking on doors, no thank you, there was really nobody else to ask for directions. So I decided, you know what, I don't care if this town seemed like something dropped out of the twilight zone, I was going to drive around until I just found my own way out, even if it took all night. But then... A big red beater of a pickup truck, as much rust as metal, pulls up and disgorged the quintessential Texan man, huge, husky, and in flannel and work boots. Without even thinking about it, I jumped out of the truck and approached him quickly yet warily. Looking into his eyes, I saw a kind human being, or at least I was hoping I did, I think. I asked him if he could please give me directions to the highway. I told him that I knew it was silly, but I just couldn't seem to find my way back. He looked concerned as I was visibly upset, so he made me laugh and very cheerfully gave me directions for a hairpin kern turn off right at the end of a small concrete tunnel that I had passed several times. He said that it often confused travelers because it was so hard to see, they need to put up signs, etc. With a sinking feeling in my stomach though, I asked him how far in miles was it back to the highway. He laughed and gave me a funny look. Miles, miss? I'd say it's a quarter of a mile at most. You can see the highway right from here. At this point, I couldn't help it. I had to know. What happens if I drive? And I gave him the directions the man in the store had given me. 
Texas looked at me very intently and asked me how I knew about that route. It was pretty far out and usually only locals know about it, so I told him. He was quiet for a few minutes and then asked what the attendant looked like and if I had a map of the state. No, just my map quest, which wasn't really helpful in this situation at all. He goes to his truck and grabs a really raggedy local map from his glove box. Spreading it out for me, he traces the route that I described and the way that the man from the gas station had told me to go led away from town, away from the interstate, and led to seemingly the middle of nowhere. Texas told me that the road did go about 17 miles, right before it dead ended in the desert. I asked him what was out there, and he told me that it was nothing but some junked cars and a few trailers and mobile homes, all owned by the same family. And this family was known locally as troublemakers, meth heads, and alcoholics, and these were the nice things townspeople apparently had to say about them. Also, the Ertzweil clerk was a part of this family and lived down that road, but I'll never forget the look in Texas's eyes as he told me this. He also told me that I was smart to listen to my instincts, and he told me to be careful traveling out there. Now, I don't know if the man from the gas station wanted what was in the back of my U-Haul or was in the driver's seat, but thankfully, because of Texas, I didn't have to find out. Oh, and uh, I learned that sometimes angels look like ruddy-haired Texans with scruffy faces and rusty pickups. So thank you, random Texan stranger. You really saved my butt that day, and I'll always remember you with tons of love. Sorry I didn't ask your name, too. But I guess now you're forever Texas to me. In 2012, I was 11, soon to be turning 12, and my family had gone to Brighton, England, to see the rest of the pack. I live in Ireland, so it's a short and easy journey over, and we did it quite often sometimes two or three times a year, in fact. Therefore, my sister and I were pretty familiar with Brighton and its streets. And one day, my sister and I met up with our cousins, both girls. Well, my sister was the oldest, about 14 at the time, then my older cousin, who was 13, I was 11, and my youngest cousin was 10. So, we were all pretty young. But we decided to go for a quick walk from my auntie's house to go to the corner shop. It would have been about maybe five minutes from the house, so not far at all. It was the middle of the day and my parents had no issue with us doing something as innocent as going to the corner shop like that. So we make our way down and we buy our goods. Can't beat a good dib-dab on a hot day. We left the shop and we're hanging about outside it. He get to eat our sweets before we got home so we didn't get shouted at. And this was when we were approached by a man. My memory of what he looked like is a bit hazy, but I recall him being around 60 years old, white hair, slightly stooped over. I remember him hanging back away from us, watching from a nearby alley. My cousins and I were young, and we just thought that it was funny. Something embarrassing and laughable, maybe. We start walking away when we notice him out of the corner of our eyes. Again, we sort of found this funny... I don't ever recall being educated on the risks of strange danger in school or anything. This was just something that I would have laughed at, in fact. But slowly, he started catching up to us. We just thought that this was a, a big game, in fact. But these days, I could smack my 11-year-old self for this, for being just so immature and stupid. But the corner shop that we were originally at was near a roundabout and a shopping center. So we began crossing the road at the roundabout. We did this several times just to see if he would follow us still, and he did. We got to the car park of the shopping center, and he approached us. Now, he was within talking distance, like the distance between you and a friend, and he was muttering incessantly under his breath. I couldn't exactly make out what he was saying, but... I do recall hearing some small words, such as swine and some expletives. And this was when our giggles got a lot quieter. Now, 
Brighton is a, a slightly rife with issues to do with mental illness and addiction. It has a high homelessness rate, in fact, and even at 11, I understood this. The auntie that I'd been staying with at the time was or is a psychiatric nurse, and she was inundated with clients and patients from Brighton. When he approached us and broke that intimate or invisible bubble that sets social expectations and normality, I immediately got a chill. This small interaction in body language seems tiny and superficial, I know, but anyone that's been in a bad situation knows exactly what I mean by that weight that suddenly falls on your chest, full of foreboding and dread. It's sort of difficult to exactly define it, but needless to say, it terrified me. I think my sister and my cousins got this feeling as soon as I did too. It wasn't playtime anymore or mockery. This was turning into a bad situation. I don't know what it was, but I just knew that we had to leave as well, and we left quickly. We started to walk away from this man without uttering a word to each other, because we all knew, I think. We walked quite fast and began to follow the road to the house. Of course, he followed us. This time, however, he was much quicker than last time. We were all genuinely scared. I mean, this man was following us, four blatantly young girls, and if he continued, he would also know where we were staying. And this was when a guardian angel in disguise swooped in to help us. It was very sudden, but a woman and her three children came out of a cafe on the other side of the road and ran across the road to our side. We then formed a sort of strange circle as we walked, her children, who were the same age as us, it seemed, at the front, and me and my sister and my cousins in the middle, and this woman at the back. She ushered us along quickly and quietly and kept saying, keep walking until I say stop and don't look back. The man started losing sight of us soon and the woman walked us home. I think that he must have lost interest once he saw the woman and her band of tiny soldiers, but we got in the house terrified and shaken up and the woman told my mum and my auntie what had happened. They were, naturally, petrified. It turns out that the woman had been watching the interaction from the cafe the entire time, from the corner shop to the car park. She said that this man was notorious for being a predator of miners, and that she recognised him as a well-known predator in Brighton. I don't really remember much after that, to be honest. Apart from my family being scared, that is. And I really don't know what would have happened if this woman hadn't have helped us. I mean, their immaturity and naivety could have seriously harmed us that day for sure. But if I could meet this unnamed heroine again, I would thank her profusely. And now at 19, I recognize this man as someone who probably had issues with mental illness or addictions. And I truly do hope that he's not causing himself or others, especially minors any harm. About 20 years ago, my parents moved back to my mum's childhood home in northern Michigan, shortly after my older sister was born. Six years later, I was born. My sister, her name is Lila, is now 21 and I'm 15. My sister and I have always been very close and growing up she took care of me pretty often. In fact, because of this, I still consider her one of my primary caretakers. Here is some info about the house, though. It is nearly surrounded by a lush forest, and we have a very large backyard. We have a long driveway that leads up to our road. On the road, there is a sort of medium-sized cemetery with graves dating back to the early 1800s, as well as many unmarked graves. Both my sister and I would actually take regular walks up to the cemetery as kids, it was a very short walk that takes less than five minutes, so it's not too far. Anyway, here's the actual story now that that background info is done. So a few years after my parents settled down in our current home, my sister was a toddler at the time and I wasn't even born yet, my sister began speaking to an imaginary friend named Bobby. My mum would find my sister outside, giggling and talking to herself, and when asked who she was talking to, my sister told my parents that her friend's name was Bobby. My parents believed that it was simply an imaginary friend, which was very common to have around that age. But flash forward to a few years later, 
My sister was approximately eight or nine years old and I was a toddler now. I was a very energetic, curious child and I would very often walk around the neighborhood while my mum was asleep. I was almost always playing outside or trying to go out on some sort of an adventure. And it was like any other day when I was out playing in the yard. My mum came and checked on me and she found me giggling to myself and talking out loud. She asked who I was talking to and I told her it was my friend, Bobby. She immediately remembered my sister's imaginary friend a few years prior, who had the same name. My mother, being a superstitious Christian, picked me up and commanded Bobby to leave. She respectfully told me that he was not welcome at our home. And after that, I just stopped talking to Bobby. Some years later, my mum and I were casually discussing my childhood when this came up. I personally had very little recollection of Bobby and only vaguely remembered having an imaginary friend. To this day, I am incredibly fascinated and perplexed by what my mum told me though. My older sister can actually still recall her walks in the cemetery and her imaginary friend. But I believe that this is an instance of children and their ability to accept reality as it is without questioning it. I would like to think Bobby was just a, a lonely soul who found joy in playing with my sister and I. But I don't really know. Please feel free, though, to share your own theories, possible explanations for this strange occurrence. And thank you for listening. So this literally just happened. I'll try to keep this as short and organized as I can, but I apologize if neither of those two things happen. I'm pretty shook up. So I'm a 29-year-old female, and my partner is a 23-year-old female. We're back in her hometown visiting her family for about a week. It's a very small and isolated town in pretty much the middle of nowhere and basically in the middle of the woods. While we were here, she wanted to meet up with old high school friends who still live in the area and whatnot. One of them, his name is Kyle. So we meet Kyle at the beach and right away he's acting just super weird making jokes about having a three-way with us and just making a bunch of really unwelcome and overly sexual gross comments about us. Obviously, we're unfortunately used to this stuff to a certain extent, but coming from someone who was supposed to be her good friend, it was really extra annoying. So, me and my girlfriend are shooting each other panicked looks the whole time, but once he's out of earshot for a second, she says that she's sorry, that he's never been like this before, and we can make an excuse to leave. When he comes back, we tell him that we want to go get dinner at a local bar, but he just asks if he can join us. We felt awkward, so in the end, we just end up saying yes. He says that he doesn't know quite how to get there, so he follows us. We get there, order drinks and food, and then head out to the patio with the drinks. He makes a few more gross comments, but is generally being way more cool and normal than he was at the beach. We're having a smoke on the patio and chilling, and the food comes quick, and we finish it even quicker. But now, here's where it gets just really messed up. So, halfway through my first drink, I'm feeling really tired, which makes sense as we've had a long day. I give my girlfriend the signal that I want to go. She makes an excuse that we need to go and he keeps trying to get us to come to his house. I've got good weed and dabs there and you can meet my cats and blah blah blah. He's being really pushy to be honest. But we keep saying no and making excuses. Like we need to check on our grandpa or stuff like that. So finally we just end up getting in the car and say goodnight. We've parked next to each other and walk up and into the cars together while saying our goodbyes. When we got into the car... My girlfriend informs me that she wants to stay at the bar, but fake it like we're leaving because she doesn't want to chill with him anymore. Understandably, too. So we're sitting in the car waiting for him to leave first when he signals for us to roll down the window. We do. And he says that his GPS is being funny. And can we lead him to the main road? To be fair, too, we are in the middle of nowhere. So this didn't seem too outlandish. So obviously, staying behind at the bar was out. In the car, we're talking about how pushy he was being, and she admitted that she feels weird driving back to her grandpa's house now. 
and so instead we agreed that we should drive into town until we lose him. He's behind us for a long time, even way after he should have gotten off of his exit. We think it's weird, but we're not sure what to do at this point. So finally, we get onto a two-lane road, and he pulls up next to us, and he's waving a phone, which is clearly my girlfriend's phone in the window. We pull over, he gives her the phone back, chats for just a few seconds, and then leaves in a hurry. But here's the part that makes my skin crawl. We know that she had her phone. I saw her put it in her fanny pack, which was on the table, along with my phone and her weed. A few minutes before we left the bar, in fact, as we were preparing to leave. She didn't take it back out. There's literally no way that she could have left it at the bar or anything. More importantly, he got in his car and left the bar at the same time as us, meaning that... He had to have already had the phone when we were leaving. It's not like we left the bar first and he saw it left on the table or something. He literally had to have been walking to the cars with us and calmly saying goodnight with the phone already in his possession. Now, the kicker, apparently, unbeknownst to me, my girlfriend had tasted a very weird bitter taste in a straw at the bar and was already very suspicious, especially with how he'd been acting. This is why she wanted to stay back at the bar to get away from him and stay in the public where she felt it was safer. So, when he walked up to the car to return her cell phone, she very casually and deliberately flashed the knife that she had kept for protection in her jacket. I didn't know at the time that she had done this, but that's why he had left so quickly, allegedly. Obviously, I was annoyed with her for not telling me her suspicion sooner, but she just didn't want me to panic. I must admit that I'm really shaken up by this. A few things are clear, for sure. One, he stole my girlfriend's phone, and it seems like he did this so that we would be forced to pull over on the dark road in the middle of nowhere. Secondly, he quickly ended the conversation and left when my girlfriend flashed a knife. They've been good friends for almost 10 years now. If he wasn't planning on doing something malicious in the first place, I feel like he would have acted maybe confused about the knife or something, or said something like, wow, why would you flash a knife at me like that? What is this, a bad movie or something? But instead, he just booked it, which tells me that he knew exactly what she was doing, reacting to a threat and preparing to protect herself and me. And thirdly, he probably spiked our drinks by the looks of things. My girlfriend noticed a weird taste in her straw right away and chose not to finish her drink. I finished half my drink and I instantly felt very tired. A few more things too. I just don't know how he managed to nab the phone without us knowing or noticing. It just doesn't really make much sense, but somehow he did. Me and my girlfriend both remember her putting it in her fanny pack perfectly. We also have no idea how he could have spiked our drinks unless... Maybe he was working with the bartender, but we were the ones that suggested that bar. I don't know exactly how he did it, but I think that I know why. And for that reason, my girlfriend's now ex-friend who made creepy sexual comments probably tried to drug us and stole her phone in order to get us alone on a dark road. We will not ever be seeing you again. I'm a female and was 19 years old when this took place. It wasn't overly late, probably about 8pm, but it was winter so it was already dark. I was walking home from visiting a friend and about 20 minutes from home. It was quiet and I had my headphones in, just listening to music, so I didn't hear this guy approach from behind me. All of a sudden this cyclist has slammed his brakes on directly beside me and is staring at me. I take my headphones out and I glance at him, but he doesn't speak, just stares. I keep walking, I'm pretty close to home now anyway, so I wasn't too worried. This guy starts cycling again, slowly now, matching my walking speed. I keep my eyes forward and ignore him, fully aware that he's still looking at me. 
To get to my flat, I had to walk down this really quiet, dark country lane, and although it was very long, it wasn't an ideal place to be with this guy. So I stopped and glanced down at my phone, hoping that he would keep going. He did, for a short while, but then he stopped and turned to watch me. There was no way that I was walking down that lane with this guy still there, so I crossed the street and went down another road, a well-lit one with lots of houses, hoping that it would be safer. And that was when he said something that chilled me to my core. Hey, where are you going? You don't live that way. I know where you live. He could have been bluffing, but the way that he said it, I believed him. I was terrified. I dialed my parents' number and kept walking, aware of this guy following me even now. When my partner answered, I quietly asked him to come and get me when I heard the guy go, Oh no and he cycled off ahead of me. I don't know what startled him so much. I guess it was because he thought that I was calling the police, but he took off, and I'm forever grateful that he did. So this happened around 2017 or 2018, somewhere around there anyway. I was in the 8th grade and quite tall for my age, 5'9". My house was for sale in my neighborhood and was filled pretty quickly since I lived next door to a school. Every day for a week too, I saw someone stand in front of the house and I assumed it was just the new neighbor. But one day I got off the bus and started walking down the street. It was in winter, Canada, and there were like tents where you put your car so it doesn't get snow on it. And obviously you can't see behind it. So when I was walking next to the one of the new neighbor's house, he was actually behind it and just grabbed me by my arm quickly and started trying to pull me inside. On quick reflexes, I hit him in the face with my keys and he let go of me. I quickly ran to my house and I called the police. He was never caught and the police patrolled my neighborhood for a week after that. And I also found out later that... He wasn't even my new neighbor. Back in 2015, I was working as a live-in home health aide for a wealthy family. It was just me and my patient living in a very nice condo in a quiet neighborhood on a golf course. We were the youngest people who lived there. I was 27 at the time. My patient was a 21-year-old male with Asperger's, SPD, and BPD and also some substance abuse problems too. He had recently got into some trouble and been legally declared incompetent. His name was Jake. Now, Jake was a nice kid, but he had severe emotional issues and almost no social awareness, compounded by the refusal to take prescribed medication, which worked incredibly well when he took it, mind you, and drug abuse as well. It was a real challenge. He was taken advantage of a lot because of the crowd that he hung around with. Right before I moved in, in fact, six friends came to hang out with Jake one day and ended up staying for two weeks, draining Jake's bank account on various drugs like meth, coke, MDMA, weed, you name it, and absolutely trashing the condo. Jake was lonely though, and he just never really said no to people. He wanted them to like him. But quite honestly, I think Jake was like maybe 14 or 15 year olds mentally, so I think that he turned to drugs to deal with depression and anxiety eventually, and also to fit in with the people around him. He's much better now though, and things have changed a lot since then. But anyway, it was a real sweet gig. I was paid very well, lived in a nice condo rent free, and basically just had to keep our house clean, keep food in the fridge, and make sure that he took his medication. When I moved in, my boss, Jake's mother, warned me about a girl, though, who occasionally stayed with her father, who was our downstairs neighbor. She told me that the girl was named Amber and that she looked younger, but she was like 37 years old, tall, blonde, and very thin. She was right, too. She looked much younger, like 25-ish or something. She said that Amber didn't have a car or a job, too, and that she was an addict who liked to use Jake. Amber's father had custody of her two children and she would come visit the kids and stay for a few days a week sometimes. 
She said too that one day Amber asked to borrow Jake's car for an hour and ended up running off with it for two weeks. Amber was also the one who introduced Jake to the six friends who trashed the condo. In other words, she was real bad news and was never allowed to be in the condo. She wanted me to call her immediately too if Amber stopped by or Jake went anywhere with her. After the theft as well, she put a GPS on Jake's car or something and allegedly she could stop the engine. But my boss made it clear that she didn't expect me to be a security guard or anything, just to notify her of things that were going on. So, leading up to this event, I had a few run-ins with this Amber character where I had to politely tell her that things like she was not allowed to come into the apartment, Jake could not take her to the store or anywhere, no, Jake couldn't go to a party at her boyfriend's house, stuff like that. Amber was always spaced out too. She talked really slow and seemed just really wide-eyed and off. She explained to me that she'd been hit by a car at some stage while riding a bike recently and complained that she was the one who ended up going to jail. I was like, how the heck did that happen? Apparently, she takes a lot of Xanax and was under the influence. So I think that that explains the spaced out part at least. But anyway, but she was never really aggressive, but it was clear that she didn't like me and often would say things like, Jake is his own person, he's a 21 year old man, he doesn't need permission. And whenever she spoke to Jake, when we saw her at the gym or the parking lot, she would be whispering sweet nothings to him, no doubt trying to manipulate him into giving her money or something. But one day, Jake was actually out of state with his father giving me a mini vacation. My best friend was staying over to spend a few days with me and we were drinking PBR and just watching RuPaul's Drag Race. It's like 11pm and we hear a light knock on the door. I go to investigate through the people and I see that it's Amber. I ignore her. She knocks louder about 30 seconds later and I watch her leave through the peephole and I sit back down telling my friend the situation. Five minutes go by and she's back. This time, though, she's pounding on the door like a cop. I'm getting annoyed by this because I'm off work and I don't want to deal with her craziness tonight, especially when my friend is over. So I say nothing and I go back to the couch. She knocks like a normal person eventually and starts saying, Hello, Jake, are you there? I need help. Hello. I still don't answer. But then I hear her try to open the door. It's locked, thankfully. Always, too, because I'm a habitual door locker. And this enrages her or something, and she starts screaming and pounding on the door just non-stop. I get up and look through the peephole again, and she looks like a demon. And her pupils were absolutely huge. So I immediately think that she's on something for sure. She looked crazed, though. Her hair was tangled and wild. She was really sweaty and just super angry. But looking back too, I'll never forget those wide pupils looking at me through an evil glare like that. In the end, I ask her through the door what she wants. She said that she needs to speak to Jake right now. He owes her money or something? Which was laughable, but she apparently needs a ride to her boyfriend's, like right now. I tell her Jake isn't home. She then asks me if I'll take her and I tell her no. I've been drinking anyway and I'm going to bed. She then let out a frustrated scream, punched the door and just left. My friend and I went to bed shortly after that and we didn't hear from her again that night. The next morning we are getting ready to leave to go to breakfast when I hear a knock like a policeman's knock on the door you know the sound when you've heard it. It's pretty much unforgettable. But I look through the peephole expecting to see Amber again. But this time, it's an actual cop. I open my door and I can now see my parking lot is full of police. And there's a van marked crime scene unit and an ambulance too. I honestly assumed at first that Amber had overdosed or something. But the cop wants to ask me if I heard anything strange last night. So I go ahead and tell him about my encounter with Amber and ask if she's okay. And he tells me that 
she's apparently in custody for the murder of her father. And does Jake own a crossbow and is it missing? And yeah, actually it is. It's been missing for weeks. He then says that I need to speak to some detective at the station. I started thinking about what had happened that night and I don't know if she came to my door before or after she murdered her father with a crossbow nonetheless, like she's a Tyrion Lannister or something, but the detective told me that his theory was that she was a heroin addict and she was withdrawing and needed to get to her boyfriend's for more dope. But she then tried to get Jake to drive her and when that didn't work, she asked her father who refused. And this is apparently what went down. So they argued, other neighbors heard that, and she killed him with the stolen crossbow and stole this truck. She only got a mile away too before she was signaled to pull over. She led the cops in a high-speed chase over the span of two counties before she finally lost control and crashed. The cops were only pulling her over on suspicion of drink driving at first, but when they went to speak to her, she told them that she was speeding because she needed to check on her dad. She thinks that somebody may have stabbed him. They asked her why she thought that, but she allegedly wouldn't answer. They sent police for a welfare check and they found him before her sons did. And so, that was the time that my crazy drug addict neighbor murdered her father with my patient's crossbow and then went on a high-speed chase with the cops over two counties. So I was about seven when this happened. My sister was uh, unfortunately a really sick kid growing up and needed round-the-clock medical monitoring so as a result we had a staff of lovely nurses who would come stay at night and make sure that she made it through the night okay. There was only ever one nurse per shift and they would stay up and watch cartoons quietly in our living room. And me being a little kid, I love cartoons as well, so I would wake up most nights at 3 and go into the living room for some secret snacks, a snuggle and some Bugs Bunny. These nurses were like family to us at this point and I adored them. Anyway, one morning I woke up to see a nurse that I didn't recognize sitting on the couch. I thought that that was unusual because it was always the same four ladies rotating through shifts, but I was willing to make a new friend. I walked out in my blankets and introduced myself. This new lady said, nice to meet you so-and-so, I'm here to watch your sister and to make sure that she stays with us. I thought that this was a sort of odd statement and I also noted how her clothes resembled the clothes that I saw my mum wearing in photos when she was a teenager, late 80s clothing. But nonetheless, I sat down on the couch. When after a few seconds, one of my sister's usual nurses came out of the kitchen with two cups of tea and said, Who are you talking to, sweetheart? I heard you get up. I quickly looked over, but the woman beside me was gone. And I was obviously very confused. I uh, told her the entire story and... She said that I must have been sleepwalking, but it's still a very real memory to me. And I mean, I even smelled her perfume as I sat beside her on the couch. I also want to add too that during the time my sister was sick, we, my mother in particular, had many, many experiences, which makes me believe to this day that my sister, she was being taken care of, not only by people in this realm, but also by people in the next. So this actually happened to a rather close friend of mine. He told me this story a few hours ago and I wanted to share it here. For the purpose of this story too, I'll call my friend Jordan. Anyways, he lives in Hayward and was attending a march for the BLM movement at around 4pm I think. I don't know what street or anything specific like that. He just sent me a couple of videos of the crowd marching and taking a knee and whatnot. So, after about 10 minutes though, he said that they were passing through a street line with shops and alleyways. There was an older man sitting on a curb by one alleyway watching the march. 
Jordan describes the man as looking upper 40s, wearing a black and white flannel shirt, and jeans and cap, and Jordan had the misfortune of walking nearby said alleyway, and the man stopped him, saying something along the lines of that he needed help fixing his passenger seat since the recliner handle was broken and it was a two-person job to get it back into its upright position. The man gestured towards his car, which Jordan examined. It was a black Chevy Malibu that was parked in possibly the most sketchiest part of the alley, right towards the back, kind of hidden behind a trash dumpster. Jordan declined and quickly walked away before the man could say anything else, and for his sake, I wish the story ended there, but I wouldn't be sharing this if it did. I think sometime later, like an hour maybe, Jordan decided to start heading home while the march continued. He says that he was cutting across some field that was in between houses where only two other people were in sight, and as soon as he emerged to the other side, his air was suddenly cut off as a thick arm wrapped around his throat and began aggressively yanking him backwards. Of course, Jordan yelled as loud as he could, and thankfully the aforementioned two guys began to rush to his aid, shouting at Jordan's attacker. The guy let go and pushed Jordan, and as Jordan stumbled forwards, he spun around and saw the guy who had asked him for help with his car hopping into the Chevy Malibu and speeding off. The two other people asked Jordan if he was okay and comforted him and whatnot. Keep in mind that Jordan only told me this over a few texts and I haven't gotten a chance to talk to him in public about it, so some more details may have been spared. I think Jordan contemplated calling the police at one stage, but didn't think that it was worth it in the end. He told me that they were probably busy enough anyway and he might be ignored or have an extremely long response time to which the only info that he had was a description of the guy anyway. Unfortunately, he just hadn't gotten the guy's license plate. Jordan went home after this though, and that's pretty much all that he's told me so far. And I know that it might sound cliche, but please, everyone stay safe out there. These are terrible times, and with all the looting and the protests and stuff like that, things like this are just bound to happen. So, I've been wanting to post this for a while now, but just really haven't gotten around to it. But I think it's time that I do. So I, a 33-year-old female, live at a funeral home owned and run by my dad. I live in an apartment upstairs and do some side work for my dad, but I don't work for the funeral home per se. Since I live here though, I tend to interact with a lot of people who are here for funeral related things and whatnot. I represent my dad when I'm speaking to someone here, so I'm always nice and helpful. I'll admit that I've had a couple of crazy people that I've dealt with, but nothing like this one. This was in mid-March sometime because it was right at the beginning of the whole COVID takeover. I had gone to pick up some food for my family around 6pm. Unless there is a service, the employees are usually gone and I believe it was a Saturday as well. So I pull into my parking lot and as I park, a car drives by me going towards the entrance side. It was a dark SUV and there are so many people who work here who have similar cars that I couldn't see from that far who it was but I gave a quick wave thinking that it was somebody that I knew. Bad idea. So the car stops and this guy gets out. Like I said, I'm used to having to help people and tell them where they can go and drop things off or pick stuff up etc. So this guy gets out and comes towards my car. I roll down my window a little expecting to just say hello and tell him that nobody's here working. He comes right over to my window and starts leaning in and peering into my car which was obviously a red flag already. It was very invasive. In fact I'm now glad that my doors were locked and I only put it down a little bit. But this dude basically had his head in my car and it really creeped me out. But before anything else, his eyes just really scared me. He was really, really pale with bright red hair, and his eyes were literally the craziest and scariest eyes that I've ever seen. It was chilling, and I don't know if he was on drugs or just crazy, but I'm already uncomfortable at this point. But he starts to talk to me and ask me if I work here and blah blah blah. I tell him no, no one is working, please call tomorrow in the morning and you can speak to someone. And honestly, I thought that that would be it. 
Not even close, though. This man came to bring me an application to my father to work for the funeral home. He was apparently in IT or something, but had studied embalming and also volunteered for the Red Cross or something. He was just talking a mile a minute, and I was so incredibly uncomfortable, but even more so when he started to tell me about how certain embalming techniques he studied included hanging cadavers by their feet and other just insane and really sick stuff. He had absolutely no experience in embalming, though. He cornered me in my car for 15 minutes and just rambled. I told him several times, please call tomorrow morning, I really can't help you. So now I'm sitting here in my car with this insane man outside of my car and I also had food on my seat. He was looking into my car so he saw it. You would think that he would take the hint. At some point I texted my husband and said, come outside now. Thank God that he actually saw my text and came out too. He comes up to this guy though and he was like, can I help you? And then the guy starts cornering my husband too. This guy had absolutely no idea what personal space was and my husband kept backing up and he would move closer every time. I took an opportunity to grab the food and get out since he was outside and when I got out he started telling my husband and I this virus is going around and there are going to be dead bodies piling up. They're going to need extra help here when there are hundreds of bodies dead. And the creepiest part was that it almost sounded like he was excited at that thought. He had a resume and I told him multiple times to please bring it by again. I didn't even want to touch anything that he had but he forced it into my husband's hands. I went to the stairs and gave my husband a concerned look and motioned for him to come in. This guy just made me so extremely nervous and I didn't want my husband out there any longer. But this guy was almost impossible to walk away from. He just didn't understand that this conversation was done. But eventually we managed to get away from this freak and we got inside. I immediately called my dad to explain what had happened and warn him of this guy. I told my dad that I had never felt more uncomfortable in my life and there was something seriously wrong with this guy. I wanted to warn him that he would probably be back the next day. And oh, did he come back. A couple of days later, mid-morning, I'm upstairs in my apartment and there are several employees in the office upstairs. I hear someone ring the doorbell. Once, twice, three times. He then proceeded to ring it non-stop for 15 minutes. They assumed it was him and didn't answer. I went out and was like, what the heck is with the doorbell? They knew it was him apparently because he had called earlier and wanted to talk to my dad and one of the employees told him that we aren't hiring, but he insisted on talking to my dad, so he came by. Then after the doorbell went off for several minutes, the phone started ringing off the hook. Next, he was going around to all the windows and pounding on them relentlessly, I had actually told them how crazy he was, but I was sort of glad that they could now see what I meant and that I wasn't overreacting. Eventually, my older brother went down, with a mask on. But like I said, this was right in the beginning and people weren't even wearing masks regularly, but this guy had no boundaries. He then cornered my brother the same way and would not let him leave and end the conversation. We were all just thinking, what the heck is wrong with this guy? My dad didn't want to talk to him, but he just wouldn't give up. Next day, he comes back again, same thing, banging on the windows and ringing the bell, calling incessantly, and eventually my dad's secretary answered the phone and put this guy in his place and told him that if he called again, that they would be calling the cops. The best part, too, is that every time he showed up, he showed up in full, top to bottom, biker gear, spandex, helmet, knee pads, you name it, even though he apparently lived just a few streets over. This guy, man, was just absolutely crazy, and I'm so thankful that he hasn't come back yet. So allow me to set the stage for this. I was young at the time that this took place. I was a marine and I was on my first deployment to Afghanistan. Not too far from my platoon's patrol base, three or six kilometers or so, was this structure that looked like a castle. 
Through interpreted conversations with locals, we were actually able to determine that they believed it was built by Alexander the Great. But whether that was true or not, I'll never know, but let me tell you that this place looked absolutely ancient. So, being Marines, we did the only thing that we thought was prudent at the time. We went out on patrol with the intent of setting up an OP inside the structure. We took our Afghan border police with us. When we got closer to the structure and our Afghans figured out what when we got close to the structure and our Afghans figured out what we were up to, they just refused to go any further. But before they left, they kept repeating the same word over and over. But don't ask me to remember what it was because this was like a decade ago and there is no way that I can remember that. But what I do know now is that they were trying to warn us of something evil. We went in anyway though without our Afghans, with the intent of staying there overnight. This place was basically an ancient fort with mud and clay brick walls on four sides. It also had some sort of a building in the middle, so we set security up, made sure we had comm checks with our patrol base, and they had an updated position report on us, so they knew where we were in case we got into trouble. And darkness fell. Not too long after that, I went up to take my turn on the wall with my friend, watch for anyone that might be trying to sneak up on us and many other Taliban-related shenanigans. And not even 20 minutes into our shift was when the weird stuff started going down. The entire time that I was on the wall, I, I don't know, I just felt watched from all sides. I turned to see a figure walking along the wall, not far from where we were sitting. I saw walking, but it was sort of a, a robed figure that looked to me almost floating. I turned to my friend to see if he saw it too, and he said that he did, but when he got his night vision back on, it was his turn to rest. The figure was just gone. We didn't see anything else after that for the rest of our shift though. We sort of uneasily finished and went to rest where I ended up dozing off at some point. I don't really know what happened next too, but I woke up to a completely black figure literally squatting on my chest. When I went to yell for help too, nothing came out and it felt like I had a hand over my mouth. I reached for my knife. I was a machine gunner and couldn't just grab my machine gun and felt like something was pinning my arm to the ground. I tried to squirm free but couldn't move so I bit down as hard as I could on what felt like a hand on my mouth. At this point, whatever weight was on me instantly disappeared and I could move and I could talk again. I was obviously freaking out, and my brothers who were around me saw me as well. My training had kicked in, and I was trying my best to keep quiet and not pass out because I was hyperventilating. My squad mates calmed me down, and after telling them what had happened, they all admitted to having the creeps and a feeling of being watched the whole time that we were there too. None of us could really sleep after that, and we all basically sat back to back for the rest of the night when we weren't on watch. We were pretty freaked out and so every noise and rustle of the wind made it even worse in the total silence of that ancient fort in that ancient desert. If you haven't experienced the silence of an open desert in a part of the world where there is absolutely zero light and noise pollution, then I suppose it's probably hard to appreciate just how any noise in a place like that in the middle of the night in total darkness when you're already alert to sounds of the enemy and now on even higher alert from something that you can't understand is just about the scariest thing anyone can ever experience. I really don't think I'll ever experience that kind of fear again in my life, ever. To finish quickly though, as soon as the sun came up we left and everyone was totally scared and none of us spoke about it again to each other. We never went back to that area again as well and... I still suffer from nightmares and sleep paralysis because of my personal experience that night in that place. The scariest part of this whole thing though is that I know that it's probably just in my head. But that's my, I guess, ghost story for you guys. And if you stuck it out, then thank you. I appreciate that you've let me get this off my chest. This happened 25 years ago. 
I was 17 years old, 5 foot tall, and at the most, 95 pounds soaking wet. On this day, I was driving a few friends home after spending all day at this lake, and because of this, I was wearing a bikini with some cut-off shorts. I was just about to drop off my last passenger, who was in the back seat and head home. I had just come off the freeway and turned on the main road into town. As I pulled up to a red light, there was a, an ambulance in the lane to my left pulling up alongside of me. Shortly after, the light turned green and we all moved forward. I heard the whoop of the siren. I checked my mirrors and I looked to my left and saw the ambulance driver had his window down and was yelling at me, telling me to pull over. I was initially confused as the siren had only been on for a small moment. I wondered if I had somehow missed seeing their lights on or something, that maybe they needed me to pull over so that they could pass for an emergency. But I was even more surprised and confused when the ambulance pulled up right next to me and the driver got out and approached my door. He then asked me to step out of the vehicle to speak with him. I was confused, so I asked why I was being pulled over. He again asked me to step out of the car with my license and registration. So I grabbed my license and registration out of the glove compartment and stepped out of the car and said, I didn't think an ambulance could pull you over like this. My friend in the back seat piped up at that moment saying that there was something off about this. The driver's eyes grew wide and he leaned into the car window telling my friend to shut up unless he'd like to be in the pair of cuffs. I again asked why he was pulling me over. This wasn't like any time I'd been pulled over in the past and the looks of the ambulance driver had been given me until now were making me feel incredibly uncomfortable. I felt just really exposed so I brought my arms up over my chest. The hair on my arms was standing on end and my gut was churning. The driver told me that he pulled me over due to my car not having a front license plate. But then I thought that he wouldn't have been able to have seen that until he pulled up and got out of the vehicle. But I did have one in the front passenger side of the windshield so I didn't have a place to attach a license plate in the front of my car. I tried to point out that I had one in the windshield but he just kept saying how much trouble I was in and that he needed my driver's license and registration. He then kept talking over me and yelling at me for many of my questions. He sounded incredibly angry and he eventually made a big deal of telling me that I was so lucky that he was letting me off with a warning and that I better not let it happen again. The whole thing was just really bizarre and left me feeling nervous and off balance. Looking back at everything now though, it felt like he was trying to keep me scared so I wouldn't question things. He didn't have a name tag on or anything or show me a badge too. He didn't have any official ticket paper. I didn't see a partner in the ambulance and... I really feel like he was counting on my youth and insecurity or fear to keep me compliant. I also think that I was lucky to have a friend in my car to witness everything. And quite honestly, I feel like that may have actually put a stop to whatever was in the driver's mind and made him so angry. I remember going home just really worried about everything, analyzing everything about the encounter and freaking out that he had my personal information now. I mean, I was already living on my own and not close to my family at that time, so I didn't feel like I had anyone that I could talk to about it. But I calmed down a bit once I remembered that my ID and registration were actually not up to date yet. I had actually moved twice that year and hadn't updated anything yet. This was in the mid-90s, so no online databases like there are now. Obviously, the whole thing freaked me out for sure, and... There was just something really malicious about this guy that I still can't put my finger on. For reference, I'm a 27-year-old female, and this story takes place 10 years ago when I was 17. I had just started university and was excited about having a, a fresh new start, since I'd always been a nerdy outcast in high school. I'd never had a boyfriend before, I'd never even been on a date in fact, so I was naive and optimistic about boys. My introverted and awkward personality hadn't magically changed since entering university or anything, so it's safe to say that I didn't meet any interesting guys at school. But one late night, 
I was in my room just working on an assignment on my laptop when I received a request on MSN Messenger. The email address was a, a boy's name with some numbers. The name was clearly ethnic and likely someone of the same origin as me. So intrigued, I accepted. For the sake of the story, we'll call this boy Ken. We got to chatting though and I asked him how he got my email address. He dodged the question. I let it go, not thinking too much of it. This was from a time when it was normal to accept anyone and everyone as a friend on Facebook and other social media platforms. As Ken and I continued to talk though, I learned that he lived in my city and apparently wasn't much older than me. As I guessed, our roots were in fact the same country. Let's call it the motherland. I asked him why he didn't have a picture of himself in his display picture and this prompted him to suggest that we turn on our webcams because he wanted to see me too. I declined, but he insisted. Somehow too, he convinced me and we both switched on our webcams. I was pleasantly surprised and somewhat relieved to see that Ken was actually a good looking young guy, chatting to me from the comfort of his bedroom. Seemingly very normal in fact. Our MSN chats carried on for a couple of weeks. They developed into text messages and we even had a few phone calls after I agreed to give him my phone number. I started to develop a crush on Ken and he'd asked me to go out with him a couple of times but I was always pretty busy with school and our schedules just weren't lining up. But finally we found one afternoon where we were both free and decided to schedule a lunch date. Ken had a car and had actually offered to pick me up from a university after I was done for the day. I was a, a little too dressed up for my C plus programming class that day, but just right for the lunch date that we had planned at a local vegetarian restaurant. Stupidly, I didn't tell any of my friends where I was going or with mum because I was embarrassed about going on my very first date at almost age 18 with someone who randomly added me on MSN waited outside my building when a black car with heavily tinted windows pulled up beside me. The passenger side window rolled down and sure enough there was Ken sitting in the driver's seat. I was happy to see that he was as cute in person as he was on webcam. However what I wasn't expecting was the intense smell of weed floating out of the car. It's not really that relevant but it was definitely part of the first impression that I got. Admittedly, I was a bit taken aback by this and was concerned that he might be driving high. He unlocked the doors and motioned for me to get in, so I did without dispute. As I sat down in the passenger seat, he immediately put his hand on my thigh. I sort of nervously shifted my leg away and I said, So, do you know where the restaurant is? I can guide you if you want. He smirked at me but didn't say anything and just started driving. Okay, kind of weird. I thought maybe he was just nervous or awkward, both of which I could sympathize with, so I let it be. I was about to try my hand at a little small talk, which I'm no good at, but then I noticed him heading towards the highway ramp. I started to worry because the restaurant was not far from my campus and there was really no reason for us to be getting on the highway. Hey, uh, you don't need to take the highway. The restaurant's really close by. I can guide you. I tried to keep my voice steady, but I began to hear my own nervousness. Ken finally spoke for the first time since I'd gotten into the car. I thought maybe we could just go to my place instead. We can play Need for Speed and I can make lunch for you. Now, I was 17 on my way to the house of a guy that I'd just met for the first time and I hadn't told anyone where I was going. My mind was racing because I knew that this would be an utterly stupid thing to do. Despite the clear red flags waving in my face, I decided that I didn't want to ruin our first date though by rejecting his offer to make me lunch and play NFS together, which I told him that I liked playing. Don't judge me. So, like an idiot, I reluctantly agreed to avoid being rude. We made it to his house though. It was apparently his family's home and was situated in a sort of shady neighborhood. We stepped inside and, of course, nobody was home except for us. It was sparsely furnished and looked really unkempt, which struck me as pretty odd for a family home. 
He informed me, though, that his Xbox was in his bedroom. I hesitated in the driveway, but he sat at the foot of his bed in front of the TV and patted the empty space beside him for me to have a seat. There was literally nowhere else to sit in his room, too, so I just sort of cautiously sat down, keeping as much distance as I could between us. And then I started to actually relax a bit as we played NFS, and he made us uh, some PB and J's to munch on and whatnot. I was about to laugh at myself for being overly paranoid when Ken did something really strange. He got up onto the bed and sort of sat down directly behind me, his legs on either side of me, in an extremely awkward position, and tried to guide my hands on the controller. I started to ask him what he was doing, and as if this wasn't uncomfortable enough, his hands moved from the controller and slid up under my shirt. That was when I really started to panic. I thought that he was going to try and grope my chest, but instead he started squeezing and massaging my belly. I was more than a little chubby back then, freshman 15 and then some, so you can imagine what that might have been like. I dropped the controller in pure shock and quickly stood up, fixing my shirt. I was at a loss for words, and he did nothing but smirk at me and tell me that he liked it. I, though, felt completely disgusted and violated. I'd had enough. I lied and told him that I had a group project to work on and needed to go. He asked where I lived so he could drop me home. Thankfully, I had the common sense not to tell him, and I asked him to drop me back at school instead, where I would be supposedly meeting my classmates, and he obliged. After our very uncomfortable first date, though, I decided that I really didn't want to talk to Ken anymore. I didn't block him on MSN or on my phone or anything, our only two methods of communication, but I just rarely responded to his messages and I ignored most of his calls. On one occasion though, he messaged me on MSN around 11pm, asking me to come over and telling me that he would send a cab to bring me over to his place. Thoroughly annoyed though, I responded, what do you take me for? Why do you even think I would want to do that? He replied, saying, no sex, I promise. It was just bizarre, to say the least. I was disgusted, and he didn't even respond again. He continued trying to get in touch with me for months, and then all of a sudden just sort of vanished. I figured that he must have finally got the point. I really do wish that the story ended here, but it doesn't. So I last heard from Ken in late February. He had stopped trying to contact me shortly after Valentine's Day. In April, two nuclear family members and I went on a holiday to visit another relative, who we'll call Anne, who was living in the Caribbean at the time. Anne, whom I love dearly, was, and still sort of is, a bit of an eccentric. She considers herself very um, spiritual and is an active member of a large well-known spiritual organization. She is deeply connected with Motherland, more than the rest of us are, and goes back for frequent visits. And while we stayed with her in the Caribbean, she told us about her most recent spiritual trip to Motherland, where she met a wealthy and well-connected local woman through the organization, who quickly became a very close friend of hers. But let's call her Connie. Now, during our visit, Anne actually introduced us to Connie virtually over Skype, because Connie lives in the Motherland. We chatted with her a couple of times throughout our vacation via Skype and got to know her a little bit. But little did we know back then that Connie, who Anne had spontaneously met halfway across the world in the motherland, would soon wreak utter havoc on our lives. Now, that's a story that I'm just not, and may never be, ready to tell because of how many lives were affected and the severity of the damage that had been inflicted. But what you need to know is that Connie was an outright criminal and a con artist who had been targeting our family from long before Anne had actually met her. Their meeting was no coincidence, in other words. Not only did she manage to steal over $100,000 from our family, but she took any peace of mind or sense of security that we had ever had as well. But when we finally caught on and confronted her, though, she insisted that we were mistaken, but disappeared into thin air once we forced her out of our life. And I know, you're probably wondering what on earth this has to do with my story about Ken. Well, get this. So, the situation with Connie lasted many months, 
The whole thing is kind of a blur to me now, but we first spoke to her online in April, and I remember the whole ordeal lasting well into the fall. But while she normally resided in Motherland, Anne had invited her to visit and stay with us where we, my whole family and I, presently live. That's when things really took a turn for the worse too. Some of the things I clearly remember and are important to the story were that, one, the whole time she was staying with us, she was trying to convince me to transfer schools to a very obscure school and program in the US, I don't even live in the US, and was actually getting very pushy about it. And two, she had asked me if I was a virgin and told me to save myself from my husband. Really weird and sort of disturbing stuff, I know. During this time though, I was so emotionally drained and stressed that I didn't really think about anything but the situation at hand. In fact, I had stopped socializing almost entirely and even started habitually skipping classes. I had lost contact with high school friends and my university friends were too new to really care, so my strange behavior and new destructive habits went pretty much unnoticed. Fast forward to another day though, after Connie's final disappearance in the fall, I was at home with my dad when my cell phone rang. I looked at the caller ID and it was a number that I didn't have saved, so it was showing the contact information as whatever the name the phone was registered under. My heart dropped into my stomach. My phone displayed a name and the first name was a man's name and the last name was the same last name as Connie's. I immediately started to panic and I ran into my bedroom to answer the call. I had no idea what to expect, and when I picked up the phone, I was greeted by a familiar voice. It was Ken. I honestly thought that I was going to puke when I came to a sudden realization that he had been a part of this whole sick plot. Of course, I don't have any hard evidence to prove that he was connected to Connie, but let me explain. So the timing of his appearance and reappearance into my life, the last name, a fairly unique surname, originating from the part of the motherland where Connie is from, and I'd actually never known Ken's last name up until this point, plus the fact that he had contacted me out of the blue and I had no idea why or how, and it was just all way too bizarre to be a mere coincidence. Of course, I freaked out at Ken when he called and I told him that he could never call me again, or I would call the police. And his response was just sort of weird, dry sort of half laugh, and then he said, well, okay then, in the most creepy voice that you can think of, and just hung up. I knew in my gut that this was their last attempt to get back in touch and somehow slither their way back into mine and my family's lives. Thankfully though, I never heard from Ken again after that day. A while after this all ended, I was having a conversation with my family member, who was also closely involved in all of this, about the whole ordeal and she told me that she sensed something extremely wrong when Connie was pushing to have me sent off to the US to that obscure school. She said that she just had a, an unshakable feeling that Connie was involved in some sort of a human trafficking scene and that if I left she would probably never see me again. And I think that the horrifying pieces really came together for me at that moment. And up until that point, I was just way too naive to have seen it before. The memories flooded back to me when I heard that. How Ken had told me no sex, I promise, when he invited me over, and how Connie was telling me to remain a virgin. As I said, I had never told a soul about Ken, nor about the weird V-card conversation with Connie, but I strongly and firmly believe that Ken had been some sort of a player in Connie's game and was just there to keep me away from guys and prevent me from having a boyfriend. For those who may be wondering, we never actually called the police on Connie or Ken because nothing illegal had technically happened, at face value anyway. It's very hard to explain, but... I'll also mention that I tried to find Ken online many times after this, and I don't know why, I felt like I wanted to expose him or call him out or something, but I was not able to find even a sliver of information on him, not by the name of Ken, nor by the name on the caller ID too. It was honestly as if he just didn't even exist anymore. 
Also, I am awful at directions and didn't remember his address or where his house was exactly, so I couldn't really use that either. And I'm sorry if this story is a bit convoluted or confusing. I'm trying to get my point across without giving any names or too many details, which makes it a little bit challenging. I do hope, though, that this can serve as a warning to young people to never trust anyone, to do your checks on people, and especially those you meet online, and to be very aware and wary of people's intentions. Also, from this incident onward, I can't stomach a lot of these spiritual organizations anymore. To be honest, though, I never really liked the idea of them to begin with, but nowadays... I've truly experienced just how they can attract both vulnerable people and also some really unsavory characters who are looking for someone vulnerable to prey on. No judgment for those who are into that sort of thing or anything, but it's just definitely not for me. But anyway, I would like to hear what you guys think about all of this. Do you think my suspicions are plausible or what do you make of this? Please do stay safe, everyone.